He is considered one of the finest male opera singers of this generation, with both the voice and the acting ability to hold audiences captivated. He is well known for his Three Devils, and is a regular fixture at the Met, La Scala, the Paris Opera, and the Lyric Opera of Chicago. Hello, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with the most recorded bass singer in history, Grammy Award winner, Samuel Ramey. What is it about opera that speaks to you? You know, I don't know what uh, what drew me to opera in the beginning. Uh, you know, I grew up in a very small town in Kansas, uh, and no, I had no exposure to opera when I was young. But I think eventually, when I became interested in it, I think it was just the fact that it. You know, I all had always enjoyed uh, when I was in high school. I enjoyed being on stage, you know, and concerts and in plays and things, um, and I thought. You know, when I first got exposed to opera, I thought, wow, this is great, you know, because, you, I mean, you're, you're acting, you're actually in a play, but it's sung, you know, and I think that's what sort of naively drew me to it. <laughs> <laughs> Why not musical theater, though? Uh, well, I enjoy music theater, too, but I just haven't had, uh, you know, that much opportunity to do it. Uh, um, I've had a few, you know, um, uh, bites about doing musical theater, but... Uh, uh, it hasn't it hasn't happened yet, but I I, I enjoy musical theater very much. I I just I would love to do Man of La Mancha or South Pacific someday. <laughs> <laughs> was it a family that just had a lot of classical music growing up? Were you familiar with it or no? Not really. Um, I mean, my whole family was interested in, to a certain extent in music. My my all my brothers and sisters uh, sang as well, and my my mother and my father both you know sang to a certain extent. So. My mother always hoped somebody would pursue music in some way, and I was her last uh, her last hope. So she was she was happy that uh, that I decided to go into music. Yeah. When I did. When did the voice hit? When did you get this well, voice? I don't know. I um, even when I was in high school, I mean, I had you know a different sounding voice from the other people who sang <laughs> in school, you know, and. Um, so I and I had a my my high school music teacher encouraged me very much and uh, and that's how I happened to decide to go into music. I decided in my senior year that I would go into music, uh, uh, go to college with the idea of uh, probably at that point of becoming a music teacher because I had, you know, still had no ex had no exposure to opera and very actually very little exposure to classical music. Uh, it was just music in general, you know, uh, that that I always enjoyed. Is it hard for you to do it? Was it was it a lot of work getting into it then? Because I would think if you've grown up around classical music and it's part of your upbringing, right. moving into that would be easier. If you're kind of discovering it at the age that you did, right. that now you're having to learn something that's in a, to a lot of people is very foreign. Well, it it was. Um, I mean, to me, it was sort of daunting when I first got interested in opera. Uh, it was was really through listening to <clears throat> recordings and. Uh, you know, I would listen to these recordings, for instance. I remember I, the first time I listened to Marriage of Figaro because I was going off one summer. Uh, this is before I'd even seen an opera. Uh, I'd gotten interested, like I said, through recordings. And a friend of mine told me about uh, the opera company in Central City, Colorado, that hired young singers to basically sing in the chorus, but they did have a small workshop for them as well. And so I went out to my local radio station and made a tape and sent it off, and lo and behold, they, they hired me. And um, so my workshop assignment, my uh, apprentice program workshop assignment for that summer was the sextet from The Marriage of Figaro. So I, I went out and found a recording of it and listened to it, and I, I remember listening to Figaro, and I'm wondering how in the world did they memorize all I got because I had a score and there was so many words and and, and foreign words that you know <laughs> right. how did in the world did these people memorize all this you know <laughs> so it was rather daunting to me when I was when I was young but but uh, it I must say it came, it I'm not going to say it came really easy I mean there was a lot of work involved but uh, but um, I just I just loved it from the from the first moment I that I saw 
I was actually in an opera in, this, this in Central City, Colorado. I was in an opera before I'd ever even seen one on, at all. Are you fluent in other languages? Well, I'm not. F no, I wouldn't say I'm fluent. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I can sort of get by in Italian and French and a little German as well, but uh, I, w I wouldn't say that I'm fluent, which have is you studied, one of my regrets that I didn't spend more time Have you studied the language. languages outside of the music, or how does that yeah, work? Yeah, I, when I was, I was in college, for a part of my... Uh, Part of my degree, uh, I was a, I was a, I was studying performance. Uh, after a while, I tr switched from education to performance. So, um, so you ha you were required to take languages. Uh, so I, I did study so I studied German and, and Italian in in, uh, in university. To sing the roles, to get into a lot of the different roles that you've sang, mm -hmm. do you have to know what the words mean, or do you just need to know the emotion and the sound and how it flows together? I think it's it's important to know. The words, what the words that you're singing, what they mean, right? And uh, uh, that's one of the first when I'm learning a new role. That's one of the first things I do is go through and uh, and translate it, uh, and you know. And so I so I do know exactly what I'm saying. Right, and I know these questions might sound elementary to you. No, but it's so I, fascinating no, about the yeah, language part yeah. of it because you're up there conveying mm -hmm. all of this in a language you don't regularly speak right, to an right. audience often that doesn't understand what you're saying, mm -hmm. and I think that's such an interesting way to present ideas and feelings. Right, yeah, exactly. But it, I, I, uh, like I said, you know, I think it is important to, to, I don't think you can really express yourself. I mean, there are, I think there are probably lots of, lots of singers who, who do just uh, learn by, you know, by rote, and they're, and they're just singing uh, sounds. But I, th I think it's important to, that you really you know, have a good idea of, of exactly what you're what you're saying, and uh, so you know in your mind what you're saying. When you're learning an initial role, you talked mm -hmm. about the first time with the Marriage of Figaro. Right. You're listening to a recording. As you get further in your career, do you do that same practice? Do you listen to others doing the role, or does that then change what you might bring to it? Um, in the beginning, when I was first learning, you know, repertoire, when I like. When I went, went to New York and I found my voice teacher there, and I was, and I, whenever I would work on a new role, I, I usually would listen to it. You know, spend a good deal of time listening to uh, you know somebody that I admired do it. You know, just to get an idea, not not to you know copy what they do. You know, because right. that's that's I think that's a dangerous thing to do to try to copy somebody else, but just to get an idea. Of you know f of, of style and phrasing and things like that. Yeah. Do you remember your debut at the Met? Oh yes, very well. <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll never forget that. <laughs> is it something that you were? Is that the pivotal moment for a singer? Do you think that still holds to be? That is something you want to do. I think um, primarily. I think especially for an American singer, it certainly is. Um, um, Maybe it's not for European singers. I don't know. I'm I'm sure Italian singers probably for them it's La Scala. But but I think the Met still you know is holds uh, you know for all singers it's a, it's a it's a milestone you know your Met your Met debut. After that debut, were you different? <laughs> well, I I don't know. I think um, I think maybe you know since my debut was. Uh, Fairly successful, right. shall we say? <laughs> yes. um, I think you know maybe I was looked at in a different light by a lot of people um, after a successful Met debut. I think that that happens a lot with most singers. If they're you know if they have a very successful Metropolitan Opera debut, I think you're you're you know you 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 move yourself up a couple of rungs on the ladder. Shall Were we you say. ready though for the reaction you got? Were you expecting it? I. I think I knew that there was a possibility that it could could be a reaction like that if it you know if I if I delivered the goods you know yeah. as as as, uh, as as well as I thought I could at the time and uh, because that moment in you know, this is Handel's Ronaldo we're speaking of uh, it's a very exciting moment in the opera because up to that point uh, it's about a half hour in my entrance I think was about a half an hour into into the opera. And up to that point, it's been a lot of, you know, doodling in the orchestra, you know, nothing very exciting. <laughs> I mean, beautiful singing, of course, but, you know, nothing very... I think I think my entrance music is the first time that the brass plays in the opera. 
And so, and, it, and it's a very exciting introduction to the aria. So, uh, you know, it, people, you know, sit up and take notice right away. Yeah. <laughs> when you're waiting for that moment, though. Mm -hmm. Now, the show has begun. Right. You're not coming on for a half an hour. What's going through your mind at a point like that? When this is your Met debut, right. this could make or break you in a sense, you know, what right. happens here. Right. What goes through your mind? Well, I think I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I think probably I was uh, back in my dressing room, you know, thinking, "Wow, I've got you know, I've got eleven F sharps to sing in this aria." <laughs> I does, think that was my main concern. <laughs> does life around you ever distract from what you're there to do? How do you keep them separate? Um, well, sometimes it's uh, sometimes it's not easy, uh, but uh, you know, I you know try to especially on a day of a performance or a special performance, have, you know, have some alone time, you know, to where I can, where I can be by myself and just think about my performance. Uh, um, but, you know, it's difficult sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I would think that that's, that's a big challenge yeah, in what you do, especially exactly. in live performance, yeah, that this right. is always going to be an issue and that we forget all of the challenges that face individuals on mm -hmm. a daily basis. And here you are going out before people who are going to judge you at yeah. what you do mm -hmm. that... That must always be kind of nerve-wracking. It is. It can be. It can, can be, you know, and it, and it never stops. It never lets up really? through a career because, you know, there are always, there's, there's always a new milestone coming, you know, whether it's a, a, a debut in a role, you know, or a, or a debut in, in, in a theater. Um, you know, I mean, it's going to happen to me this, this, this coming summer. I'm, I'm, I'm making my Boston Symphony debut and, and my Tanglewood debut at the Tanglewood Festival this summer after all, all these years of my career. <laughs> I'm making another debut, which is, doesn't seem possible. <laughs> and you still get nervous about them? Sure, I still get nervous. I still get, you know, I've, I'm not, I've never been a real nervous performer, but, but I, you know, there's always some butterflies, you yeah. know, for something like that. Talk a little bit about the difference between doing a role in a studio, recording a, a, yeah, a piece right. and performing it live. What do you do to bring as much authenticity to the piece, no matter where? Well, <clears throat> it w it was um, that was a problem for me, and in, in a lot of my early recording, well, a lot of recordings I did, um, I did uh, especially early early on in my career. I did a lot of uh, I recorded a lot of things that I had never done on stage, and actually. I recorded a lot of things that I've never done on stage because <laughs> I, you know, I would just at that time I was so happy to be offered recordings that I would, you know, I would just I would say yes to, to anything yeah. recording wise. Um, but it certainly helps if uh, if it's something you're fam very familiar with and if you've done it on stage um, because then you know you can in the process of doing the recording you can actually in your mind anyway put yourself into a performance since you, if you've had uh, a, you know a lot of stage experience in the role singing outside of acting the role does that change it for you well th i mean that, that that can be a problem too uh, because you know studio recordings can be a bit uh um uh sterile you know because there is the lack of electricity that you have in a in a in a, in a stage performance and also, you know, during a recording, you know, they're they're always after perfection. Everything has to be, you know. Right. I mean, you 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 do do you, you sometimes do things over and over until you know it's perfectly you're perfect perfectly together with the chorus and the and the orchestra and you know and maybe some note wasn't quite right, so you do it over again, you know, just to get <laughs> a certain note just right. And uh, you know, so it can be a little bit, I think sterile studio recordings um, i mean a lot of them you know have you can capture a recording a, a performance atmosphere but uh, but there is that danger of them being you know just very perfect <laughs> what does a good director bring to a role for you and i ask that because oftentimes you have the roles that you play and you go around and you play certain characters mm -hmm. that have mm -hmm. become your signatures but you're going to be working with different directors along the road what do they bring different to your performance? Well, that's a good question because uh, I don't know. That's one thing that uh, that uh, has always interested me uh, in doing. You know, my my repertoire of especially, well, for instance, what I'm involved right now in doing a, um, a Gounod's Faust. Uh, 
and this is probably the role that I've sung more than any other in my repertoire. I've done more than more than twenty different productions of it. So it's always interesting to me to go into a new production of something like that because uh, to get to see if you can can uh, work with a director that will give you something new and and something interesting. And I think that's that's what's uh, fascinating about this business. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I've, I've always I've always felt that I've worked most successfully with directors who who work less in great detail and and give you sort of uh, a chance to do something on your own, you know, right. and like that, as opposed to somebody who, you know, comes up to you and says, no, lift your hand this much, you know, for, <laughs> you know and I've worked with directors yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I, that's I've, you know, to give you a little bit of freedom of, a, of your of your own expression, you know. And I wonder, from a challenge point of view, they're hiring you to do a role that they know you do. And mm-hmm. so, as an artist, when you come in, are you trying to do what they want from you, or are you trying to find something new each time you do the role? Do you understand where I'm? Going yeah, with that? I mean, yeah, I mean, a, a little bit of both. I think you know right. you. you um, you, you want to you wanted to you want to work well with the director and right. do and do you know what he wants, but at the same time, you know you want to uh, you know you want to do something. Maybe you have your, your own ideas. I mean, that right. can always be a danger in working with a director. You, if you come in and have too many of your own ideas, you know that can that can sort of put a director off. But uh, that, and that's another thing that's fascinating about the business. I think. Now, this time in Faust, have you discovered something new in your character this time out? Well, I, I had done this. I had done this production a long time ago. I, I, I did it actually. I, I may be mistaken about this, but I, I think I did the very first when it was very when it was first done. Uh, I did it in I think around eighteen nineteen eighty nine or ninety in Dallas, and with with uh, Francesca Zambello, and uh, I think that was that was when it was brand new. So coming back to a production, yeah, it's interesting just because I know it's been done. Right. In different places, uh, a number of times, and it was interesting to come back and see just how much it's uh, evolved or changed since, you know, since the the first the first time, you know. And I'm uh, assuming you've evolved and changed from the first well, exactly, time you did right. it too. Yeah. And see. Yes, exactly. As do you think of yourself as an actor too? Because I know there's so much acting involved in it, but how much of it do you see yourself as an actor? Well, I, I like to think that I'm a good uh, actor. I think. I think that you know we've come to expect opera singers to be good actors. You know, long gone are the days of you know stand and sing opera. Right. Um, you know, and I think that's a good thing. I mean, it's a. Um, I think the, the public and everything is, are more demanding that way these days, and certainly the directors are. You know, and uh, I, I. But I just think it's. Uh, I think it can be such an exciting uh, art form, you know, that when it's when it's well sung, well acted, it uh, there's nothing more exciting to me than than this art form. How do you keep this art form alive, though, for the next generation coming up? How do you get them interested in the big O? You know, opera. Yeah. It's like, ooh, that's scary to them. That's a, you know, that's that's a challenge. I think uh, you know, like I know all opera companies are are afraid of. That, that that they're losing their audience, you know, because uh, uh, the graying of the audience, uh, the graying of the the audience, they call it, or the public, or whatever they call it, and so it's it's a it's a constant challenge now for for opera companies to uh, to uh, expose and and to to uh, and try to get the younger people in to uh, to pr- to the opera. What have you seen that successfully worked? Well, I think Peter Gelp at the at the Met right now is uh, has has done some very good things. Uh, you know, uh, uh, putting a lot of opera out, uh, and they and they and uh, David Gockley did it here in Houston too. You know, putting putting things out on a big screen for people to, you know, per, and inviting people to come and watch. I, th- I think I think that's you know that's a, a very good very good way to try to to uh, to bring in to increase interest. Uh, yeah. Or spark some interest in in young people. Now you've had three major devils in your career. Got a favorite? 
Well, I, that's a, that's that's tough. It, I mean, it would be probably be between the Guno and the and the Boita. I, I've always said that if you know if my if somebody really twisted my arm and forced me to pick my favorite, I'd probably, it would probably probably be the the Guno Mephistopheles because he's such a you know such a multifaceted, uh, multidimensional, fun fun character to play. Can you separate out then the things you learn as one of the devils and you bring him to the other one? Or do you have to stay very true to what is in the score? How much of it can be, you know, I've noticed this over here. I can bring some of that to this role. Well, I think it's possible to, to, to bring certain things that you do, especially between Guno and Berlioz, because they're, I think they're, the Boito is, is I think, is, in a, is on a plane by itself because uh, it's much more, much more powerful and dramatic and... Uh, and whereas the Guno and the Berlioz are much more, you know, I mean, they're, they're French, for one thing. <laughs> so they're much, a little bit more, uh, I don't know, he's a, a little bit more debonair, a little, uh, a little more charming devil than the Boito. Yeah. Do you have a favorite role you haven't played? One that has just always been something you've wanted. And it can even be something out of your voice range that couldn't realistically be yours, but... Well, uh, probably, uh, I mean, one that I, that I in, in my voice range, that I've never done that, and that I hoped it, but probably won't happen at this point, is um, uh, Silva in Verdi's Ernani. It's a role that I've wanted to do for a long time, but it's just never, the opportunity has never presented itself. Probably a role that's uh, somewhat out of, my, uh, out of my range, out of my repertoire, would be so- something like uh, Iago in uh, Otello. Yeah. You know, I think he's a fascinating sort of villain, and it would be uh, very interesting to to play him. But it's just it's just a little bit out of my vocal range. Yeah. <laughs> Outside of the world of opera, what would we find you doing? What is it that you enjoy doing when you're not doing this? Well, I enjoy. Um, uh, I love going to movies. I love going to <laughs> uh, <laughs> very mundane, very you know. <laughs> uh, I love going to. Uh, uh, you know, theater, when it is, you know, good theater towns, uh, things like that. I'm, right now, I, I have a, a three and a half year old son that keeps me uh, on my toes, very busy when I'm not singing opera. Is he into classical music yet? Does well, he, his? he he s- seems to enjoy it. I mean, he likes listening to it. So, uh, but we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> does he hear dad's music, or does he hear just classical music in general? Do you play your own? Oh yeah, I play I play my own my own things for. I actually, very recently, I was playing um, um, a DVD of uh, the Boito Mephistopheles, the production I did here in Houston, and uh, p- played it for him. and And he looked at it and he said, "It's Red Daddy, <laughs> <laughs> the old red costume." You know? <laughs> Can you watch your own stuff, listen to your own stuff, and enjoy it, or do you listen and watch with a critical eye and ear? Uh, yeah, I I. Tend to listen, uh, watch, and listen more critically, you know. Than it's the same thing. It's why I almost never listen to my my recordings. And that's why I asked if you play yeah. those for me. Are you sitting yeah, there all the time? Yeah, like, you know, I, I almost when I when I was very active doing a lot of recordings, and when I would get you know get the first copy or something, I would some I would usually listen to it once, and that would that would be it. I would, <laughs> and uh, you know maybe in my my re- my retiring years that I'll, <laughs> I'll sit down and listen to a lot of them again. I'll find you in a lounge chair listening to yeah, your music. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Are there certain things that you've done? Like I, I'm familiar with your carousel and other things. Is there a Broadway bent to you that still calls you? No, I'd, I, I would really like to do something, uh, something on Broadway or at least somewhere, anywhere really. I, I mean, Man of La Mancha is a, certainly something right. I would just love to do sometime. Uh, South Pacific, uh, some of the you know some of the old uh, Kiss Me Kate, <laughs> yeah, things like that. Some of the, some of the things like that. I you know I'd love to if, if the opportunity ever presented itself. <laughs> now I know that in your profession, you folks are booked way in advance. How mm-hmm. far now up through the future are you booked? How many years? Well, at my age, I, you know, in the past I've been booked up to four to five years in advance. So. <laughs> but you know now, now at my age, I think you know a lot of the people are saying, oh, "Let's see, uh, he's going to be how old then?" <laughs> so they're not booking me quite so far in advance. I'm only booked now for maybe uh, two, two and a half years right now. 
Is that fun or is that daunting? I would think that when you're saying also the four years and five years right. in advance, yeah. I would feel loss of control over my own life to some degree. Well, there is there is that. For, I mean, you feel, wow, if you accept something you know, four years ahead, you know, uh, you think, well, my life is so planned out. They said, I mean, on the other hand, it's nice to know that you're going to be working in whenever four or five years from now. But there is, but there is that, and you know, you accept something so far in advance. You know, you 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 think, well, what if something better comes along? What am I going to do then? And yeah, it can be, it can be, I think, sort of oppressing sometimes. Yeah. Last question for aspiring singers and lovers of classical music out there: Where would you tell them to start with learning more about opera? Well, hmm, that's a. That's a very good question because, you know, if the problem is, you know, uh, young people, it's difficult for them to, some of them can't, can't afford uh, the t- price of tickets to go to the opera. I mean, I, I, think, I think, you know, the best thing is if they can, if they can to go, just to, to, to go to the opera. Um, I don't know. And that's... So go to the theater, go out there, see it done live and experience. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, Samuel Ramey, thank you very much for taking the time and sitting down with us today. My pleasure. Nice to be here. Thanks a lot. Samuel Ramey. To order a DVD of this or any episode of Interviews, please visit HoustonPBS.org.